I have to admit that uh, I came here uh, thinking about me as a builder. Uh, and Francis talks makes made me think. I'm here now, so I guess I'm an advocate. Does it uh, mean that I'm a builder advocate? Um, I'm not an expert for sure. You're going to see my code. Um, and I've learned quite a few things uh, in two days here. So am I like an explorer? I'm a explorer builder advocate. Is, is that is that a thing? Can can you be more than two things? Is this like the cap theorem where you have to pick two or three? I don't know. Anyways, um, this talk is about something that I built. Um, I really, uh, I, I guess I have something like for Git infrastructure. Uh, this is the, the second company that I work for that does kind of similar thing. Uh, I, I'm going to assume everybody in the, in the room knows what Git is, but just like a quick reminder, Git is a distributed version control system. Uh, it was designed with the premise that you can have different copies for the same code in different places. At any, any time, you can reconcile those copies in one single place and get resolved conflicts for you, and you can point it to different places. Uh, so that, that was its philosophy, right? Uh, I'm going to do a really quick walk through the history. Uh, it was born. 10 years ago this year, um, it was designed to satisfy the requirements that the Linux kernel had. Uh, they had to change virtual control system for reasons that I'm not going to talk about. Um, and Linus Torvalds uh, one day decided that he had enough. And he built a Git in three days. Um, if you go to the Wikipedia article, it's really funny because it says, in April 3rd, he built a Git, and three days, six days after, the Linux kernel was hosted in Git. And that was it. Cool. Um, if we fast forward in time, um, in 2008, uh, this company called GitHub uh, launched. Uh, it wasn't the first Git hosting. Uh, there were others before. Uh, they did something really well that was uh, to bring community together. Um, and I was there for like almost three years. Uh, so I, I saw how like the company grew and how the community grew. I learned a lot about Git, about how to actually scale that thing. Um, like about 2010, uh, other companies started to pop up. Uh, they basically uh, work with data that they pull from GitHub or Bitbucket or like any other Git repositories, and then they store a copy in the servers, and they they do different things. They analyze the code, uh, they build the documentation for the code, they build like your tests. They do different things, right? Uh, but they all have something in common. Um, they need to store your data in their servers. And at some point, all of them ask this question, how do we make Git faster? Um, if you pull one repo, that's fast, it's pretty fast. That's OK. Uh, if the repo is like 4 gigabytes, it's not that fast. Um, if you are pulling thousands of repo per minute, it turns out that it is not that fast. Um, there are other reasons why they think that Git is not that fast. For instance, uh, all of them start doing this, right? I'm, I need to check what's in the log. I'm just going to shell out uh, to Git, and I'll parse the, the output, and everything will be fine, right? Uh, until it's not fine. Because, like, can anybody tell me what happens when you, like, 
chill out. What happens at the kernel level? Like, there are a lot of things happening. There is a syscall, uh, call fork, that it copies all the file descriptors. Um, it assigns a new feed for the child. Um, it copies semaphores. It does a lot of things. If you if you go to like find out what it does, it's like it's a huge list of things that happen when you just shell out, right? Um, and if you shell out once, it's fine. It's only once. Um, if you shell out thousands of times per minute on your server, that's not that fine, right? Um, you can get an output here. But you never know what happens in the middle. Git log is like a pretty quick standard operation, but you really don't have any control on your server when you do this, right? Uh, there are other problems like uh, writing logs. Uh, when you do a git fetch, uh, git actually logs your repo. Uh, so I. Uh, the data is not corrupted, and you can operate it. Uh, at this, you can operate with your data, right? Um, but if you chill out, uh, you don't have any control over those logs. Uh, you can arrive to have concurrent fetches uh, that try to write the same data at the same time. And since you don't have any control over those fetches because you're just shelling out, uh, Git is gonna crash. Because it's designed to just run once on your repo to do fetch. Just one at a time, I fetch, I fetch, I fetch. If you do it concurrently, it just crashes. Uh, and I've seen a lot of times that error happening. Lots. Uh, other people found the same problems uh, and decided to do something. Um, they decided to build libraries uh, to actually work with the data that Git, that Git generates, right? Um, since, the, since it's open source and the format is pretty straightforward, you can just build a library to read the data. Uh, it's actually, if you go to your, if you clone a, rep, a Git repo and you go inside the .git repo, uh, directory, you can say that there is an objects directory and that's it. Everything is stored there. And those are just files that are compressed and they have a specific format. So if you know how to work with compressed files and you know how to read a file, uh, you basically know how to work with Git. Um, so there were several implementations. There's JGit, it's written in Java. Uh, it's, it's very used, it's used for like things like Eclipse or Garrett uh, and other tools that, uh, that interact with Git, and then there is libgit2. It's built in C, um, a standard C. Uh, it's linkable, uh, so any any language that uh, has bindings for C can just libgit2 to read uh, Git data, right? Um, so there is a binding for Go. Uh, it's called git2go. Um, it's, uh, it supports any operation that Liquid 2 supports, so you can do pretty much anything. Um, I'm gonna show you some examples. I'm gonna go uh, pretty quick. Uh, the code is probably not perfect. I don't handle any error, sorry, Brian. Uh, I'm gonna say that since, like, Brian's rule, I'm here, my code is perfect, so it doesn't matter that I don't handle errors. Um, for instance, uh, when you import Git to go. Um, there is something happening in the background. There is a side effect. libgit2 uh, is thread safe, so it uh, it uses uh, thread logger to store to to store some uh, some stage. So if you do fetches at the same time, uh, it knows that that it doesn't need to override everything and it, there are no collisions. Or like if you try to read an object and your git fetch just delete that object, uh, it it knows. Uh, it doesn't crash or anything. You have full control over uh, the store, uh, which is nice. Um, you can do things like creating new repositories. 
uh, you can clone from from whatever you want. Uh, you can use clone BSH, clone BHTP, uh, like you would use like with uh, the command line tool. Um, you can create remotes. Uh, if you wanna fetch for from different places, you can just add new remotes. Um, you can search for objects. Uh, giving a SHA, you can say, okay, this SHA is a commit, give me the commit, or this is a blob, uh, give me the blob, or this is a tree, and it gives you the, uh, the, the, the whole tree structure for your code, right? And if you don't know what, SHA, what, SHA, what that SHA is, uh, you can just say, give me the object, and I'll figure out what it is, right? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can, you can read what's inside an object, uh, so you, you actually have access to your code. Uh, giving a SHA, you can say, okay, I want the contents for this file um, in that specific uh, moment in time, uh, and then you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, you can analyze the code, you can find, you can like search for vulnerabilities, you can create documentation, you can like run tests on, on that code, you can do whatever you want. Um, you can also write, uh, so you can create no, new commits. Uh, the index is the staging area that you probably know about. So it's like, instead of doing git add uh, a file, you, you do index add by path. Uh, and then you just like get a commit and say, All right, okay, this is the parent for my new commit. Just like create a commit. It's very straightforward. Um, so at Code Climate, we, we changed our Git infrastructure to from shelling out everywhere to using Liquid2. Uh, we use some A-B testing tools uh, to make sure that we didn't break anything. Uh, we actually run, uh, run both in parallel uh, at some point, uh, and we actually run uh, requests to both of them at the same time at some point. And we had these like, this graphs that uh, display like, uh, the control was the old uh, shelling out the uh, methods, uh, and, and you can see how there are like spikes there, and we didn't know what they were. It's like, I don't know, I don't have any control here. Um, and then the green one is like the new code that uses Libg2, uh, and, and the, you can see that there are no spikes. Like, the, like it was completely flat. It's, it operates at the same, like, it's really, it really, really, really improved everything. Um, one of my, uh, I think, one of the things I was uh, more happier about, more happy about is like the memories for like the new Git infrastructure went from, I don't know, I, it was eight gigabytes of memory to use 40 megabyte, uh, 14 megabytes uh, in Go, uh, which was like pretty amazing. Like right now, like we used to have all these problems because the it looked like the, the server was going to burn at, at some point. And then it just stopped. And now it's like, oh, we don't know what to do with the rest of the memory in this server. It's like, we put so much. It's like, um, so cool. Uh, now you have tool just like to remove all that chilling out and all that crap and, and do actually, uh, actually call something robust and like that can help you to, to scale to whatever you want, right? Um, now, uh, how do we design something that can scale to thousands of repos or maybe millions of repos if you're GitHub or if you're another uh, source code repository? Uh, uh, the, like the first, like the most, like the first initial like architecture design is this one where you have your application. Obviously, you don't have, want to have your all your Git repos in the same server where you have your application, so you just put it somewhere else, right? And you have, you build something that just reads for, uh, data from the git, git data and just like send it to the application. And that's what's pretty straightforward architecture. Uh, you, you build like, you put disk replicates, you just read uh, just in case this crash because this crash all the time. You use SSDs, by the way, um, that's a, a huge improvement. Um, so we, we have this Git service here. Uh, the first thing that we need to do, 
or like what I like to do is it's going to straight your data model. Uh, Libby two gives you like some structures. They're pretty straightforward. It's like you can have a commit. This is a, this is a structure. You have like a blob. Um, and uh, it will be like really easy to just like uh, and, uh, just marshal those and like shell them, like send them like over the wire, and then the application could unmarshal those and just read the data and all that, right? Uh, but then you need uh, you need libg2 in the, in the ser in the git server and in the application, but uh, you actually don't have any git operations in the in the application level, right? So why do you you need to like just spread your uh, libg2 everywhere, right? Uh, I rather, like my personal option is to work with protocol buffers when uh, when I need to just like send data like over, right? Uh, and that, given a schema, it gives you a contract, right? So if I'm not the one design, designing the, the client that reads the Git data, um, it's pretty straightforward just to get the schema, generate the protocol buffer for the language that you want to use. And that's pretty much it. What you, that's pretty much it, right? You don't need to like worry about, uh, I'm working with Git, I'm working with a database. It's, I don't know. You don't need to worry about it because it's just a protocol buffer schema. It's it's pretty straightforward. Um, so, for instance, in this example, uh, I have a function uh, that reads uh, branches from all the branches from a repository and just creates protocol buffer and it sends it. Uh, and then we can just like have a, a HTTP handle that sends the protocol buffer over the wire, uh, and you don't have to do. It. It's like it just it uses HTTP, and anybody knows how to use HTTP, right? It's just an API. You just turn your complicated Git infrastructure in an HTTP API, um, and you can scale that uh, as much as you want. You can you can put a load balancer, you can put a cache, you can do whatever you want because it's just HTTP. It's a pretty simple problem at this point, right? Um, or maybe not. Uh, so I like to think about this problem. I, I like to think about this problem from first principles because at the end of the day, we're we're designing a distributed system um, that actually handles a lot of data. Uh, so I start with this, the cap theorem again. Um, so Dr. Eric Brewer like postulated this. It was uh, if you have a shared data system, a shared data system can have at most two of three following properties. It can be consistent, it can be available, or it can be tolerant to network partitions, right? So consistency means that if you have the same data in different servers, uh, when, when you update the data, uh, it's updated in all the servers at the same time, uh, right? That, and that's consistency. Availability, it's obvious, like, you have, uh, at some point, you can actually get the data. Um, and partition tolerance means that uh, those nodes where you have the data distributed can talk to each other. Uh, and you, and if there is some a partition, like if the network goes down, uh, you can some way handle that, right? So you pick two of these. Uh, but there is a caveat. Uh, uh, work. Uh, wrote this post that says you can sacrifice partition tolerance. Uh, you can pick either consistency and partition tolerance or availability and partition tolerance. And it's why? Why is this? Uh, it's because uh, consistency and availability is something that you have to work for and use, something you, you implement. Uh, but if you have a distributed system, you, you always you are always going to have it in different servers, and different servers are always going to have a network in the middle. It's something that's there, you cannot ignore the network. Uh, so you cannot sacrifice partition tolerance. It, it doesn't matter if you if you believe that the network is going to be always available. You're just wrong, because networks go down all the time. Things happen, like the switch crashes, whatever. Uh, so you have. We have to have this into account. Um, and it's so obvious for a lot of people that 
uh, there, like if you try to uh, use some kind of library to handle partition tolerance, uh, there are actually at least three written in Go to do this. Uh, so it's it's obvious that that's a problem, right? Um, so all these uh, li libraries uh, follow something called a uh, circuit breaker pattern, uh, and they are based in in the premise that um, at some point something is going to go bad, uh, and you can set some thresholds to actually handle that properly. Uh, uh, as an example, I I like circuit breaker not only because the irony of Ruby is uh, writing Go because. Scott is my friend. <laughs> um, but it's a, simple, a very simple API where you just like, uh, you have a wrapper uh, to the HTTP client, and you can say, uh, this client is going to tolerate 10 consecutive failures. If not, if, when there are 10 consecutive failures, um, the circuit is going to break, and all the logic is going to go th through that uh, break it trip, right? Uh, so when the network goes down, uh, we try to send requests. Uh, it fails it 10 times. And then it just starts just like going to, to that function and execute like that function. And then you can decide there what you want to do, right? And internally, it actually has a timeout. And it tries to tries to those operations again over time just to make sure, if, to make sure that you are still in, in that state where you cannot actually send uh, requests over the wire because the, you, you already know that they are going to crash, right? Um, so that's that's a way to handle partition uh, partitions. Um, then uh, we need to talk about uh, consistency and availability. Uh, at some point, you're going to want to replicate uh, your Git data. Uh, uh, so you're going to have something like this, for instance. Uh, you're going to have two servers where all the data is replicated uh, so in case of one of them burns down, you still have the other one there, right? And you're going to be happy because you're not going to lose all the data, and you're not going to need to download all the data again from GitHub. Um, uh, so there are different ways to do this. Uh, uh, an obvious one, since Git is, a, is distributed, you could make uh, both servers talk to each other and actually tell the re you could tell the replica to fetch from the primary, right? Um, but uh, if one of them goes down, uh, if the primary goes down, then you need to make the replica the primary and then put another replica and then you have to change uh, that connection so the new replica fetches from the, from the old replica. That's, that's slightly complicated. Uh, so my solution is like, since both like, get data from, from GitHub or like your external repository, why don't we make both to just like download the data from GitHub? And actually, you can have the same code in both the primary and the replica doing the same. But and the only thing that we need to do is like make the primary to tell the replica to just fetch from GitHub, and then we can handle uh, problems if there are any problems, right? So for instance, like the application so says the primary fetch, and then the primary is gonna go to replica is gonna be fetch, and then when the replica is done. Uh, it sends a message to the primary, and the primary sends a message to the application, and everything is fine, right? Uh, and it's done. There's like, all right, that's a pretty straightforward like uh, workflow to actually have your servers more or less in consistency. Uh, so the, to design this, it's like I wrote some some code. It, it's not like the best code ever, but uh, you can you can see that it's just a function. An HTTP handle that says, "Okay, I'm gonna replicate this request," um, and it returns uh, a channel, and then uh, this is the, the primary. The primary says, "Okay, I have this channel. I'm just gonna fetch," and then after fetching, I'm just gonna wait until the the channel is done. And what that replicate request does uh, while the primary is fetching from GitHub is just like um, it goes and it tells the replica to fetch also too. And it uses also it actually uses the same endpoint that the primary has to to talk over. It's like it's just another HTTP request to the replica, right? And then we have the channel that we return. Um, and then uh, after waiting for the server, we need to do something here. Uh, 
So if we if we want to have if we want to pretend that we need a strong consistency, you could do things like returning the header the the Git head in both servers and compare to make sure that everything is like replicated or like if there are like some crash or something you just you you need to handle right. Um, so all in all, um, you see this. Uh, there, there, there is more than just like I have Git. I download repos. That's pretty much it, right? That's not. That's not it. Uh, there, there is a lot of things to take into consideration. Uh, I like to to think about this problem, uh, like if Git was a giant database, uh, and you need to deal with the same problems that the giant database has, right? Um, and that's it. Thank you.